Good morning and welcome to Granite Rock's virtual Tech Talk web series. This is the second of three installments. My name is Keith Sieberson and I am your host today. I'm the Director of Marketing and Community Involvement here at Granite Rock. My job today is to help us navigate this meeting and make sure that we're in the right place at the right time and asking some questions along the way. For your information, we will be recording this in event for future reference. In a minute, I will introduce to you our guest experts. If you have questions during the presentation, please add them to the chat section and we will answer as many as possible. To make the most of everyone's time and stay on schedule, we may have to limit the number of questions that will be answered live. If there are lingering questions at the end, we will attempt to get those answers to you along with the survey upon completion of today's session. For this program, we're asking everyone to keep themselves muted and your cameras off. The chat is open, so we encourage questions or comments throughout the meeting. We are honored today to have with us Tyler Bodner. He represents the California Nevada Cement Association, CNCA, as the Director of Geotechnical Markets. After spending over 11 years as a municipal engineer, Tyler now provides technical support and educational opportunities for cement-based solutions, including full depth reclamation. Tyler also functions as the Technical Director of the Recycling and Stabilizing Association, RSA, of California, and is actively involved in academic research, DOT specification committees, and several other associations, including ASCE, CalGEO, and APWA. CNCA serves as a nonprofit trade association that provides industry expertise designed to responsibly transform our built environment. Tyler's experience and knowledge of all facets of capital improvement projects make him a trusted resource for public agencies and private development organizations. He graduated from California State University, Chico, with a degree in civil engineering and is a licensed civil engineer in the state of California. He also has two daughters who may or may not be joining us today, it depends on how tightly locked that door is. And now I'd also like to introduce to you our internal Granite Rock expert, Dennis McElroy. Dennis has a formula to fix California roads while saving taxpayer dollars and reducing construction's impact on the environment through in-place recycling strategies. Dennis started his career 10 years ago as an asphalt milling operator and now manages our construction division's pavement recycling group, which includes milling, CIR, and FDR processes. Dennis and his team have worked with more than 50 public agencies to adopt CIR and FDR into their pavement maintenance programs. Their efforts have resulted in improved smoothness and durability of over 500 lane miles throughout Northern California. Dennis represents the road recycling industry as part as one of four industry members of Caltrans PMPC Asphalt Task Group and is a founding member and the president of Recycling and Stabilizing Association of California. His focus is facilitating adaptation of pavement recycling techniques through education, value engineering support, and constructability reviews. Dennis is married, has a child, and he's got another one on the way. This will be a very open discussion, so please submit your questions, inquiries, and points of clarification, along with points of interest, as you see fit during the discussion in the chat box. And with that, gentlemen, I will turn it over to you. Put your cameras on, and Tyler, I think you are sharing first. Great, thanks so much. Keith. My pleasure. Keith has a good uh, voice for radio and a face for TV. I should have locked my door because I guarantee one of my two daughters is going to try and come in and make an appearance. Uh, Dennis might be in the same boat, so we'll see how that goes. I am going to quickly share my screen. Bear with me just for a second. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody who's on board here. It's a pleasure to, to join my good friend, 
uh, Dennis McElroy. Him and I have spent a lot of time together in person over the last couple of years and probably even more time uh, virtually like this. So challenging times right now. I hope everybody is safe out there and I'm happy that you chose to join us today. So let's jump right into this. We already had a little bit of an introduction as to who CNCA is. I'm not going to talk much more about it uh, other than the fact that you can see the seven member companies that we represent over here. Uh, there's three of us licensed engineers that represent CNCA. We've got pictures that I've included because none of us look like this anymore after the last year and what the pandemic's done to us. Interesting fact, all three of us have two small daughters at home. So there must be something in the, uh, in the cement, we say. It's not just us, our executive director, also two daughters. So go figure. Maybe Dennis has got another daughter on the way. We don't know yet. Um, another, no, another. <laughs> go ahead, Dennis. Do we know? No, another daughter for sure. Yeah. She's okay. <laughs> Good. I, I figured as much. Um, so as you guys read these bullet points here, the other, uh, the other thing I wanted to pinpoint is that our services are free. Um, anything that we provide is, is at the mercy of these seven companies. Uh, we really enjoy leaning on our past expertise uh, in assisting all facets of folks that are trying to build successful projects. And that's really our job. So that's how I've gotten to know Dennis. That's how I've not gotten to know a few of you that are on this call uh, from cities and counties and uh, consulting engineers just the same. So with that, I wanted to do a a little bit of an intro with Dennis uh, about how we have collaborated and partnered collectively with Caltrans over the last couple of years. Uh, I personally served as the committee chair for an in-place recycling group uh, within the PMPC that Keith mentioned. Uh, Dennis is very involved with that group. A couple of uh, major tasks that we took on last year, uh, very successfully I thought, was to infiltrate Caltrans and really make sure that they were trying to take a collaborative approach to the future of in-place recycling within our state. And as we all know, a lot of the state practices trickle down to the cities and counties, um, and, and we need to make sure that those specs are sound, that everything that comes at that state level is constructible, feasible, buildable, all of those good words. So Dennis, do you want to talk a little bit about what you took on with the PMPC uh, before we move on? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Tyler. So uh, I'm one of the uh, four industry members. Uh, I represent the uh, recycling industry as part of the asphalt task group within the Caltrans headquarters PMPC program. And what that means is we work together to figure out how to allocate resources and dedicate those resources towards uh, developing new specifications for um, strategies that we think are important. Um, FDR, uh, CIR uh, being being some of those. Uh, Tyler and I worked for the last year and a half to um, roll out a statewide training program for the, uh, the state of California DOT. And uh, it took us about a year and a half to develop that. And it was a two day course. And so I just want everybody to know that today it's just we're going to be doing some high level, uh, you know, just general information uh, coverage on this thing. And, and there's no way we're going to be able to go into all the details. I just want to remind everybody that we're a resource. Um, CNCA is a fantastic resource. I can't say enough about Tyler and his team. Uh, and they're uh, they're just easy people to get along with. So um, if you guys need more information. Thanks, Tyler. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dennis. And a couple of those major tasks, as he mentioned, we took on the in-place recycling presentation, uh, which is really an educational forum that was a partnership between Caltrans, us on the industry side, and academia uh, with the folks at UC Davis. Uh, we also successfully did a revision to section 30-4 of the Caltrans standard specs, which pertains to full depth reclamation with cement. So uh, one of the reasons that we took on that task with them is we just can't afford to get any worse. Uh, there's not a lot of room at the bottom of the rankings as far as nationwide road uh, condition indexes. And the way that Dennis and I see it is that if we continue with the same old thinking, we're just going to continue to receive the same old results. Uh, this was actually a slide that Caltrans chose to share during that in-place recycling um, training forum, which showed that in the last several years, we've been near the bottom of the list as far as what our urban uh, interstate mileage uh, is is stacking up against other states within the country. And I believe since we pulled this data from the 23rd annual report. I think we've gone down. Uh, so that's the wrong direction that we want to be headed. 
Uh, and we're going to get into a lot of reasons why we think these solutions, FDR, CIR, uh, can help reverse that course. So uh, here's, a, here's too many words on a slide, and I hate to do this. I don't expect you to read it all, but I did want to highlight a couple of uh, areas on here. This is actually a snapshot from the Caltrans in-place recycling website that's been revamped. Uh, you can see an arrow at the top as far as the RSS, the revised standard specification for 30-4. Uh, that is available for use. That's in that's supplementary to the already approved standard spec uh, for FDR with cement. Uh, the two arrows below that, I, I did want to note another important fact that Caltrans is looking at some terminology changes. Uh, they have adopted the term partial depth recycling, which is synonymous with cold in place recycling. I believe Dennis is going to be talking about CIR. Um, so just know that those two terms are interchangeable. And then you can see the bottom arrow down there in the in the bottom section. Uh, there's actually a, a recording and a PDF version of that webinar uh, that is available upon request from Caltrans. So uh, if we don't get into all the nuts and bolts of what you'd like to hear today and you want a more comprehensive explanation of what we showed the state and what we presented to the state, feel free to reach out to us and we can get that to you. So uh, here's some examples. You have a CIR project over on the left. You've got a horrible uh, road condition over here on the right. And what I wanted to get across is what Dennis already said. If you guys are running into issues with your projects, we're going to give you an overview today, but call us. It's our job to help you navigate these challenges. I've got a picture in the center here. This is my colleague, Clay Slocum. Some of you may, may know him from working on projects in the past. It looks like we need to tune him up with a safety vest and maybe a hard hat to protect that pretty balding head of his. But these are the exact things that we do. We love to visit your projects. This was a job in Santa Cruz with Santa Cruz County. Uh, the picture on the right was a fire damaged road in Calaveras County. And this is what we love to get out there, get boots on the ground. Uh, Keith mentioned my experience as a municipal engineer. Many of those years I spent as a resident engineer before progressing my career into managing the engineering staff. So I love to get on site. I always wear my safety vest, uh, unlike Clay here. And uh, please call us, reach out, and we would love to do site visits, virtual presentations, whatever you might need in order to help with your projects. So with that, I'm going to jump into the meat and potatoes of the presentation, which we'll start with the basics of what FDR is. And I, I put a nice complex explanation that tried to boil it down into its simplest form up on the screen. And what's important with FDR, and I think this is a good, uh, this is a good progression from last week's um, seminar as well, is that we're taking a process that historically in the past was conven conventionally meant we took materials and we got rid of them. We exported them and we brought in new stuff. FDR is really taking a distressed asphalt layer, the underlaying layers, which is the aggregate base, and then many times the uh, subgrade material below that, it's pulverizing, churning them up, adding a, stable, a stabilizing agent like cement uh, or foamed asphalt, and it's creating a, a uniform, more homogenous base layer. So that's the, that's the basis of what we're going to be talking about here with FDR. Some of the benefits of FDR that, that we'll get into, the cost effectiveness compared to uh, other strategies, whether it's removal and replacement, whether it's dig out repairs with leveling courses, with fabric, with overlays, all these different ideas that we've seen over the years, uh, it's really proven to be a cost effective replacement for those. Uh, contractor evolution is a bullet point that I hadn't put on until uh, I actually added it for this presentation. And I think it's an important one. Granite rock didn't function as much in the FDR space up until recently. This is an important fact uh, for most of you folks on this webinar that the contractor base is not only growing, but they're getting better. They're getting more experience with what they've done on these types of projects. And that's a real benefit for you guys. Uh, I love to see the investments that they're making towards these types of technologies. And I think that's a really key bullet point to discuss. FDR can give us higher structural carrying capacities. It's increased durability because you're talking about stabilized bases instead of just compacted granular bases. Uh, the one point I put in italics uh, and in blue is where this differs from an approach like CIR or PDR, which is it gives us the opportunity to improve the roadway geometry uh, like super elevations, cross slopes. We can reshape the material through this process. 
uh, unlike what we can with some other strategies. Uh, shorter construction time, early open to traffic is clutch for our public. We know that that's key to getting in and getting out. Uh, reflection cracking mitigation is something I'll talk about throughout the presentation. Uh, and then the reduced carbon footprint, the sustainability aspect that our state claims to um, be shooting for as far as their goals, FDR can be a real, uh, a real benefit to them in trying to achieve those goals. On that, on that front, sustainability, a big, huge chunk of the sustainability and um, sustainable aspect of these types of projects comes from the truck trip reduction. We've heard a lot about uh, aggregate. We've heard a lot about trucking and how we get materials from one place to another from uh, Fred last week. And with FDR compared to a removal and replacement, uh, we're talking about one bulk cement truck up here in the top left, replacing about 40 uh, truck and trailer trips that you see in the bottom right. So that's 20 trips of export material, 20 trips to import new material less fuel and less damage to the roads. A lot of times the roads that we've designed and that we're using, the worst traffic they'll ever see is from construction equipment. It's from the loading of these truck traffic, of this truck traffic on those roads. If we can reduce that, reduce greenhouse gases, then it's really mutually beneficial for the public, for the contractors, for the state, and we can hit these goals together. One, uh, one agency that's further down south from most of the folks on this call um, is Los Angeles County. And Los Angeles County is, a, is an agency that we've worked a lot with and we've talked to them about what they've been doing down there. And they've done a fantastic job of quantifying what in-place recycling impacts can be. Um, and when we try and strive to reach goals, it helps to quantify them so we can actually report on what we've done. And what they have done uh, in the last several years is you can see there some of the metrics that they've come up with. Almost 85% reduction in GHGs, 80% reduction in energy consumption, and almost 500,000 cubic yards of uh, reduction in landfill material. And you can see in this graph, without uh, going over everything on this slide, being that it's pretty busy, is that they're looking at different approaches for the different conditions of their roadway. So FDR comes in in that bright red portion at the bottom, failed roadways. Uh, in Los Angeles County, they've talked about uh, FDR with the term soil stabilization. They've also adopted strategies like cold central plant recycling, where they're recycling that distressed asphalt as well as stabilizing um, the section underneath it. And then you can see CIR up above that in the rehab portion as well. So. I encourage all of the agencies that are on this call to, to try and quantify some of what they're doing to try and get that recognition for adopting these strategies. So FDR, in my opinion, is just making way too much sense. And I've got a couple of graphics up on the screen as far as where I see this. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry. Just want to make sure that there's no questions coming in. So, the, uh, on the left side, you can see the emblem for SB1. We know that SB1 has been around now for a few years, and we this doesn't give us all the money that we need in order to fix all of our roads, but I'm hoping that it gives us a fighting chance to do a little bit better job to improve our roadways. Um, and I feel like now, as we've gone a year, two, three years into receiving these funds, we can start moving away from just painting everything black to secure those funds and actually putting those funds to good use. So coming up with a bottom-up approach to rehabilitating our roadways like FDR can do, um, I believe is a great use for SB1 funds. Take advantage of those dollars while they're here. Over the next 10 years, let's get a solid base and foundation for our road network. The next one is, uh, is a snippet from Map 52, which you guys heard about last week. Um, that was a great presentation on our dwindling aggregate uh, supplies and availability. It's not just that our rock supplies uh, might not be sufficient moving into the future, but it's incredibly hard to permit new quarries in this state. So this is as good a time as ever to try and get ahead of that curve and utilize what we've coined an urban quarry. Let's use these assets we've already paid for, we've already placed, let's pulverize them in place, add a little bit of a binding agent, and continue to build these roads long into the future. So that was a great presentation by Fred, and I've been sharing this map for many years. It's good to see he's out there. Uh, spreading the word as well. This is a chart that I wanted to share. This comes from the ARA uh, BARM, the Basic Asphalt Recycling Manual from 2015. 
Um, and it's a good chart that talks about the different stabilizing agents and which soil classifications that they work well for. You can see lime. Uh, we know that lime is a good soil stabilizer down at the bottom. Cement is shaded in blue. We've got foamed asphalt above that. And this graph does a good job of showing the versatility of how cement uh, can work for your FDR treatment. It's important to know that what's shown in in uh, green at the top of this, these are the soil classifications, but when we're talking about FDR, you need to factor in that there's granular material and, and wrap, the distressed asphalt above it, that's being mixed into this conglomerate. So cement can handle the granular materials as well as some of those unsuitable soils below it. And it's really the full matrix of that material that lends so well to uh, cement being that agent. Lime has its place when we're talking about, um, as you can see, clay sands, highly elastic, fat clay materials, which we see a lot of in the Bay Area. But when we add that pulverized um, asphalt uh, material and some of that aggregate base material for FDR, you really see cement thriving as the agent for FDR. When you look at foamed asphalt, that's where you're talking about thicker asphalt sections. Uh, Caltrans has some roads where there's 12 inches of asphalt from overlay over overlay over overlay. Uh, that's where the foamed asphalt can work. So when should FDR be considered um, as you're looking at, at different project selection? The first one is when there's flexural distresses in the wheel lanes. Uh, you can see a good picture here. This was from Santa Cruz County. Um, if you have a good survey of the pavement condition index, anything below 55 is generally in poor condition. That's where FDR can thrive. The third bullet point is an important one, excessive dig out repairs needed. We've heard different thresholds over the years, 25%. If you have more than 25% of your roadway being looked out for dig out repairs, FDR might be more economical and give better uniformity. Um, I've seen examples up here in Yuba County uh, where it was down to 15% where the numbers started to, to pan out. So it's really important that we look at these projects on a project by project basis and we try and figure out where that break even point is those dig out repairs are getting really expensive and they're only fixing the worst areas not knowing that the area adjacent to it might be failing soon after um, and then again if you need to increase that structural design of the road very few of us have roads that are getting the same traffic now as they once were when they were designed uh, our populations have grown our road uses have grown usually it's heavier truck traffic uh, is being as being used on these roadways and then it does give us the ability to correct pavement cross slopes hey tyler real quick i wanted to yeah, jump go ahead on the uh, excessive dig outs i think it's really important for everybody to grasp um, i've been there where i'm out on a job and I'm, I'm walking with an engineer and we're trying to lay out the base repairs on a job and we're getting pretty close to that 15 to 20 percent and we have a dig out area and then right next to it there's a bunch of cracks that we can't get to because we have um, a limited quantity or a limited budget to work with um, this is a really important uh, thing to really focus on. Uh, a lot of times we don't or can't repair the entire pavement section with those uh, those base repair budgets. So when we're looking at FDR or even partial depth recycling, you're able to recycle the entire pavement section. I can't ex express that enough. Uh, and then in the end, it's gonna help you with your long-term maintenance costs and, uh, and allow that road to um, deteriorate evenly over time, which is gonna help you guys out on the, on the maintenance side. So I just want to reiterate that, Tyler. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'd like any time from a contractor perspective, please jump in. And, and I bring up that point because I've been involved with several projects where it's actually been the prime contractor who has looked to value engineer the dig outs out. Uh, they've looked to value engineer some of these processes that are multi-step and in favor of going with a one-step approach for FDR. Um, and I think that's really valuable, not only to the agency, but to the contractors who are looking to build these projects. So. More about project selection. Uh, we talked a lot about this when we did our Caltrans training, but but so much of designing these jobs is how do we come up with the right treatment early on in the process? Um, just like with dig out repairs, we hate to get too far down the road and then have to change things at the last minute. The contractors like Granite Rock would much prefer to know exactly what they're going to be building when they get out there. And a lot of times it's our, our jobs as engineers uh, to get out and take a peek at these roads and see what's going on. And I know that the pandemic has made things challenging. I'm sure a lot of you folks are working from home. Um, and I've been a part of a lot of projects uh, over the last several years with CNCA where an engineer reaches out to us with an idea and I go drive the road and I find that 
that is not the correct application for what's out there. And I don't believe maybe they had either up to that point. So a couple of pictures, just doing drive-bys of some of these areas to figure out what's going on on these sites to, to drive them, feel the rideability, look for things like you might even be able to find on Google Earth, like this image uh, to the side. We can virtually drive a lot of these roads now. It's kind of a desktop study, if you will, where we not only can see what the drainage issues might be or the pavement condition might be, it also gives you an indication of what type of traffic these roadways are getting to. Um, by hopping around on Google Earth. So I really encourage everybody to do a little bit of due diligence uh, when it comes to project selection to, to take a peek and say, you know, is this a good CIR candidate? Is this a good mill and fill? Or are we looking at severe base failures where FDR is the better option? Tyler, we've got a question here uh, that may blend in um, from Sarah. Some of our older roads were paved in PCC and overlaid in AC. Can these roads be uh, reconstructed with FDR, and are there any special considerations in that case? Yeah, that's a great question, and I, and I know, I believe there's some gentlemen from City of San Jose who are on this call too, and we got a very similar question from them recently. Uh, FDR is not a good candidate when there's PCC underneath those roadways. It's going to create havoc for the pulverizers, and there's actually been issues in years past with Caltrans uh, where improper site investigation was done. Uh, or site investigation wasn't done at all, and they didn't realize there was PCC down there. So we have a whole suite of other solutions at CNCA where we can assist on a project level basis. I believe my colleague Clay even drove to San Jose last uh, in the last few weeks to give the city of San Jose some tips about how those uh, streets might be rehabbed. But that's a great question from Sarah, and we we do not want to be using this process when it comes out. That material needs to be. Uh, removed and as we all know it's it's usually recycled and turned into something else but thank you for interrupting and please continue to do so okay so as we move on to site investigation and mixed design once we've decided that fdr is the right treatment uh, for this roadway um, based on maybe a desktop study as built it's really important to figure out what's going on out on that job site, out, out on the limits of that roadway. And one of, the, one of the big issues that's come up over the last few years is where do the responsibilities lie? Who needs to come up with what? And then what's the responsibility of the contractor? So we hash through a lot of these deals from a Caltrans perspective, and I think it translates well to the local agency side too. Um, where we see the agency having the roles and responsibilities is investigating what that existing pavement structure is that's out there. Is it an inch of asphalt over six inches of AB over native? Um, or is it six inches of asphalt over six inches of PCC where we, we made the wrong decision? Um, the agency also needs to come up with the TI and the R value. So hopefully they put, can put some money towards figuring out what the R value of the underlying soil is. Uh, determining what the TI needs to be based on uh, updated traffic information. Um, and then once we have the TI and the R value, that's really the only two uh, items that we need to come up with what that new pavement structure needs to be. It's very easy. It's very basic within the highway design manual as far as how we come up with the design of uh, typically an HMA over FDR layer. Uh, and then once that design has been done, which is something that CNCA can absolutely help uh, any of your agencies with or any of you consultants with, we do this almost every day of the week, then the bid documents should specify to the contractor these four areas, square yardage of the FDR, the depth of that FDR treatment, which correlates back with the design, the target unconfined compressive strength, the UCS, and the tons of cement that's going to be used as the agent. I, I typically like to see those items broken apart from each other and bid separately. I think that does everybody a favor as, as far as administering uh, the contract on these projects when it comes down to paying them. Then when the contractor, the low bid contractor gets this job, they are going to run the mixed designs of the representative field materials uh, and come up with the actual cement content uh, to achieve those designs. When they hire somebody, oh, go ahead. Please Sorry to interrupt you there. You're on a roll. Uh, we got a question from Ed Schwartz. Uh, it says, shouldn't an agency at least run a pH test in the investigation phase 
to know whether or not the material being recycled will react with the cement. Do you have anything that, you want to add to that? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And we're, I'm going to talk about some resources available. And in the sake of time, I didn't want to get too into the weeds. Sure. But there is, there's, there's kind of a, a suite of tests that would be helpful as far as sulfate resistance of the soil um, and things like pH to see what's, what's actually going on to make sure that these are good candidates. So yeah. Ed's right. I know he's got a lot of experience with uh, site investigation. And the more that we can gather, the better. I think one, one important point to take away, I'll jump back for a second, is that the money spent up front is money well spent. Um, I know it might seem like it, it costs too much at the time, but it's a lot cheaper than having to deal with CCOs down the road. So yeah. I'm a big proponent of running, running these suites of tests. Um, and we've got some great guidebooks that are available to you folks that show you flow charts of everything that should be tested for. Um, yeah. In the sake of time, I just didn't want to go over every single one of those. But great question, Ed. Sure. Uh, did you see the Zach's and, uh, and Sarah's questions as well, Tyler? Uh, I didn't because of my share screen, if you wouldn't mind reading yeah. those. Yeah, so Zach, uh, Zach Azari, he asked, uh, can we also use a percentage of cement per weight? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is actually the graph where I think it answers that question. So your cement content is by dry unit weight. Um, and this is a typical graph that you would see based on a target UCS of 400 PSI, uh, taking a range of cement contents. In this case, it was 3, 5, and 7%. Uh, which is a good range. I think it gives you a full spectrum. It shows you, it shows you the, the climbing of that curve, uh, and then it helps you correlate that design UCS strength back down to the cement content by weight. Uh, did you want to read the next question from Sarah before I yes further? I can actually jump on this one too. So Sarah, she asked, uh, and a great question, Sarah, can you please discuss the trade-offs of having an agency develop the mix designs versus having the contractor do so? And, and from a Contractor standpoint, um, when we're bidding a project and we're using, uh, like for example, the Caltrans UCS range of 300 to 600 PSI, that's great. We're always gonna recommend that the more investigation you do up front during the design phase, the better and, and less likely you're gonna have contract change orders on the back end. Um, the reality is, is if the, the site investigation isn't done thoroughly up front, there's the potential for changes later, and we want to minimize as much of those changes as possible and go in with a, with a really good certainty of what we're dealing with. Um, there's also the, uh, the question of whether or not the material is going to react with that, and that's kind of the part where I, you want to jump in on that, Tyler? What, what do you think? Yeah, well, I, I don't think there's a wrong answer to that. I, yeah. I, I continue to feel as though too much site investigation is doesn't exist. Um, if the agency did want to put the effort and the money towards coming up with a mix design, uh, they can do that. I, I'm a firm believer that most specifications and most contracts are also going to have the contractor verify that yeah. mix design. They're not going to go out there and not dig their own test pits and either per self perform or hire somebody to verify what that is which then would be cross verified by the agency again to make sure that everybody's speaking the same language. So yeah. I, I don't think putting that money is wasted uh, would be my initial, my initial response to it. Um, but I do, I do think if enough information is known, if we know that the agent is correct, the depth can be performed. Um, we've done a, we've done an adequate, as built research desktop study we know where the utilities are we we know that let me jump back for a second that the depth is good the area is good the footprint that we have an idea of the soil materials because we've done our value testing that we can achieve a strength like this um i don't think they always need to do the mix design up front as well i think that can be put on the contractor um did you have a did you have a different question i that no, you were asking as far as the reactivity? No, that, that was the last one. I think the big thing okay. here is, is it managing expectations. So um, if you're doing a site investigation up front, that's fantastic. That's going to give you a level of certainty there. And then if uh, if you want the contractor to verify mix designs, it's a it's an opportunity for the contractor and the owner to be on the same page and work out problems before you actually hit the grade and start doing work. And then you're dealing with a live production operation possibly getting interrupted due to potential changes on the job. Absolutely. So and I, and I think without, without naming names, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Dennis, without naming names, Dennis and I have recently ran into something like this where a job was put out. Uh, it was assumed that there was a nominal depth of asphalt. There was a certain amount of aggregate base below it. 
uh, once the job was awarded to the contractor, they sent their person out to get representative field samples. And there was about an inch of asphalt and there was not very much uh, granular material below that. But before it turned into crappy subgrade, that was filled with cobbles. So if we knew, if we had spent the money, if that agency had spent the money and gone out there, you know, just think of the time savings for a project like that. The contractor can hit the ground running. Um, yeah. So absolutely, this money is incredibly well spent, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Sarah, Zach, and Ed. Appreciate it. Yeah, Thanks, please, Del. please keep them coming. And this is what I was hoping for. I think the the banter is what's the uh, the biggest takeaway from this. Not just boring old me and Dennis talking incessantly. Uh, before I jump forward from this slide, um, I did want to talk a little bit about um, what's floating out there as far as recommended ranges for UCS strength. The Portland Cement Association has a great guidebook, which I'll talk about later and we can provide to anybody who needs it. It's actually free, available online in PDF form. They have a pretty tight window. They, they recommend uh, three to 400 PSI. Caltrans has recently come up with a range as part of our work in their committee last year, uh, which is three to 600. I think, that's, uh, I think that works as well. I think that's a, that's a fair range to shoot for. The Green Book in Southern California asks for a minimum of 400 PSI. Their FDR, they call Cement Stabilized Pulverized Base. Everybody's got different names for things. And I just want to put a, another note on, if possible, uh, us at CNCA and, and folks in the industry really advocate for a thicker section, trying to disperse that strength across a deeper section. Um, if we try and shrink it up too much and add too much cement to try and come up with the structural carrying capacity there, you can get too much strength, which can be detrimental and can lead to shrinkage cracking down the road. I realize that we can't always do that. We have utilities, we have crossings, we have culverts, things of that nature. So we can get creative with what to do with strength when we run into those uh, types of scenarios. Now, I didn't want to get too much into the design um, as far as the, the highway design manual, but I did want to note UC Davis is, is looking at uh, coming up with new recommendations for the HDM. And instead of a sliding scale of gravel factors and gravel equivalencies, they're actually looking to have a, a single gravel factor of 1.7, regardless of the UCS strength. So they're essentially advocating for as long as we're hitting stabilization of the materials, then we can use that higher, less conservative gravel factor because we feel very sound about that homogeneous, uh, uniform, strengthened base. So um, I'm not going to dig too much into the weeds with that, but please follow up with me if you want more info on that design standpoint. So again, I sometimes my colleagues and I, we come across as the worst cement industry representatives ever because a lot of the times when we meet with agencies and, and designers, uh, we're trying to remind them that higher cement content and, and bigger strengths does not equate to better durability and performance. So you'd be surprised that that's one way you can help cut costs on your project is by don't shoot for that 600 PSI limit uh, if you don't need to. Try and be at the lower limits of that. As long as we're getting stabilization, that's going to save a ton of money on your jobs. And it could be just as durable and uh, a well-performing job as you were hoping for without shooting for that high end. Okay, construction. Uh, we'll get into a little bit and I'll probably have Dennis chime in here. I made this slide a few years back and I think it does an okay job of talking about the process as far as pulverizing. I think one one good um, aspect to, to focus in on is removal of excess material. If you're trying to keep existing grade and profile the same, there might be some cold milling that needs to happen up front. This is a fantastic application for county roads, areas that aren't flanked by curb and gutter. And if you can come up in elevation, then you can recycle 100% of that material in place. But even if we do have to skim off some of that asphalt, it's being turned into wrap. Uh, you're probably going to buy it right back as far as the HMA that goes on top of the FDR, or you could choose to use it as shoulder backing, uh, or maybe even flip-flop it to another project as supplementary aggregate. So instead of staring at this slide too long, I actually wanted to share, see if I can get this to play. This was a video that was actually done for a job in Monterey County. I believe it was either two or three years ago. And it just does a better visual uh, job of showing what's going on on these projects. 
You can see when the cement is spread, uh, the new Caltrans spec has vacuum suction specified, so you're not seeing a lot of fugitive dust in the wind as you might have in the past with uh, different equipment. Um, here you can see the mixing of the material once that dry cement is spread. Um, Dennis, feel free to chime in too from a contractor standpoint. I don't need to do all the talking. No, uh, yeah. I, once you're uh, once we're done with the video, I'd like to flip back to the previous slide. I think absolutely that's a really good visual. Um, this right here is a packer. It's a soil packer, open ring, so you're able to compact over 12 inches deep and up to 18 inches deep. Um, the way it rolls is instead of being a solid, smooth drum, it's got uh, grooves in it and allows you to to compact deeper. Um, it's a good representation after the initial compaction. Uh, behind that, you'll see a, a grater right here, and then you'll have a, a smooth drum roller in the back of the screen there that's finishing up doing the final compaction effort. Uh, what's really cool about this is you're mixing the materials that you had on the job and you're not off hauling anything. That ties back into what Tyler mentioned and, and what uh, earlier and then what Fred mentioned last week. When we look at roads, when Tyler and I look at roads, we look at it as uh, a, an actual aggregate source. It's like a, a mine where you have all this good quality rock that we can build new roads out of instead of importing new stuff. Um, right here, final paving after a, a short cure period. And once the final overlay goes down, you get your finished striping. You're going to raise utilities uh, if you have them, and uh, you're 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 off to the races. Um, is that the end of the video there, Tyler? Yeah, that yeah. is. Thanks for jumping in. So I'll, I'll jump back, and if you want to elaborate on this before we move forward again. Okay. Yeah, so, so this one right here, when we were looking at the pulverized section, I'm going to hit it one more time, and I'm going to talk about it again in the after, or when Tyler's finished up with this uh, the FDR presentation. When we pulverize the roadway, we're reusing aggregate. That rock doesn't leave. When we don't remove rock or import rock, that means the trucking goes down. That means greenhouse gas emissions are saved, and it means cost is reduced. You're able to reuse that pulverized rock on the third image, and you're, you're, you're stripping off some material there to leave room for your new surfacing or your new wearing course. On the fourth step, you're stabilizing it. That's when you're adding cement, and you're bringing that pulverized rock up. Uh, stronger than a base rock and it's basically your substitute for your new base layer you're bringing that road up from a pci below 55 up to a level 100 once you put your new resurfacing on without importing a whole lot of material which is fantastic and that removal part is really important he makes a comment here at the, at the bottom says if necessary if you don't have to remove the rock then don't remove the rock that's that's more costs so he showed monterey county county road um, no curb and gutter um, I've even seen it where we do have curb and gutter and you can adjust the profile of the roadway and increase the cross slope. Sometimes the roads are flat. You can push all that to the center of the road and have a 2%. Uh, if you can keep the material on the job, it's it's going to reduce cost impacts and uh, and stretch those tax dollars. So th thanks, Tyler, for letting me jump yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely. And another point, and Dennis might be able to speak to how they look at this, but when you look at that fourth uh, image on this schematic is when that when the cement is added and you have that stabilized base layer there is a swell factor to account for and we typically say there's about a five to ten percent swell of that material when the cement yeah. is added uh, right. it's a bulking if you will um, now keep in mind when we're factoring in swell factor it's good to know for how elevation might rise uh, be raised but we can we can trim this material but we don't want to add to it so we don't want to under uh, or overestimate the swell factor and then have to do what's referred to as sliver fills with the stabilized material because then you've got a, a slip plane. So if anything, you want to overbuild slightly, you can always trim that during the process before that new surfacing goes on top. Yeah, yeah, that's hard to nail down too because every every road kind of reacts a little differently. I think that percentage you threw out is pretty accurate. Um, and when the contractors come, in, come to you guys with plans as an owner, um, and we're, we're talking about removing material. Uh, sometimes it, it gets kind of confusing. Uh, it's just a good thing to partner on and really understand once you're actually out there building the job and, and uh, be receptive to it because you might end up at a different spot than where you intended. Um, yeah, thanks, Tyler. Absolutely. All right, we'll keep plugging ahead. Um, so curing is such a crucial component of doing the FDR process. You can see here, uh, this is a road that was done flanked by curb and gutter. Caltrans actually actually requires an asphaltic emulsion cure. Uh, so that being the SS1H or CSS1H, that's in their spec. 
Um, the reason that they that they require that is they like the idea of it being locked in and getting it open to traffic and even being able to stripe it temporarily stripe it to get these roads reopened. Um, curing is can be done either that way or through the moist curing technique. Um, so just by using a water truck, which is usually on site anyway for a, for a standard conventional uh, construction project. Um, a lot of agency allow for moist curing. They just keep that truck. They keep the operator rolling. It it helps the uh, asphaltic emulsion from tracking across driveways. Some of the this process is being used in some high end areas. You know, the Bay Area. There's expensive houses. Southern California. They're doing this on the middle of uh, you know Los Angeles boulevards. Uh, the contractor doesn't love to have to clean and detail everyone's Porsches and uh, and Bentleys driving down the road. So moist curing can be done effectively, uh, but here's an example picture of it with asphaltic cure. Now, if you're expecting really high temperatures, really high winds, sometimes it behooves you to choose the asphaltic cure, get a good blanket down across that because that bottom note curing doesn't take the weekend off. Um, you can't just moist cure it until Friday and then go home you know, and watch football all weekend and come back on Monday and think it's, it's going to be gravy and pave it. You really have to nurture this. The cement is continuing to hydrate. Um, the beautiful thing is you're getting the granular compaction through this process up to 95%, and then you're also getting the internal cure. But it's that internal cure that really gives you that stabilized benefit of that base section. Hey, Tyler, I got a question for you here. Yeah. Uh, Zach jumped in and he said, please discuss how long to wait for the cement treated subgrade to heal before capping it with a pavement layer. So how long is that cure period? Yeah, so let us let me jump forward. I, I intend on talking about that as soon as we address microcracking. And the Perfect. reason we're going to address microcracking uh, is because this is the controlling factor. Uh, microcracking has been changed slightly as part of the revised standard spec through Caltrans. Uh, but it's been a common practice uh, across all of the competitively bid contractors in the state. And it's it seems to be working. And this is a good mitigation for long-term shrinkage cracks and reflective cracking coming back up through the pavement, uh, the top pavement section. Um, Micro cracking is, you can see here, it's a method spec for the most part. Uh, 48 to 56 hours is what Caltrans came up with. Uh, your heavy 12-ton uh, vibe roller, uh, steel drum roller at incredibly low speeds, very high amplitudes, two or three passes. And what it's really doing is it's creating a network of fine cracks in that base, um, which uh, reduces the stiffness without jeopardizing the strength. So by creating a bunch of these little uh, micro cracks in the material, uh, we're hopeful that we don't get the block cracking down the road. And it's proven to be very effective. Um, this is done the base continues to cure uh, when you jump on at least two days later with the micro cracking. Usually the micro cracking is done the same day that the top topical paving takes place on top of that FDR base. So you're looking at about a two day lag from the final compaction uh, and finished grading of that material to when you can start slapping an HMA course on top of that. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think you nailed it, Tyler. Okay, we'll just uh, we'll keep jumping forward because the next slide pertains to traffic and surfacing. You know, this is a process that can be constructed under traffic. You can see a picture here uh, where you're just simply coning off one half of the roadway. Uh, typically, there's a pilot car situation that's walking people through a two lane scenario. Like I said many times before, this is a perfect application for these county roads, um, which most of which are this two lane. Um, undivided highway type of scenario. So that compacted FDR base can be opened immediately to low speed traffic um, with the pilot car traffic. And we've seen it hold up just fine. As I mentioned before, you're getting granular compaction, just like an aggregate base section up to 95%, as well as internal cure. So you should feel just fine about putting this traffic on these roadways, making sure that speed is controlled and you're not getting carried away with the truck traffic right off the bat but the turnaround time is phenomenal. When we look at traffic control, it's not just these county roads. Uh, here's an example of a major arterial where uh, we can get creative with flip-flopping traffic. Um, I've seen the city of Roseville uh, as part of a project they did two years ago. They did K-Rail down the side, down the center, and they flipped 
uh, two lanes of traffic onto the opposite side. They took care of all their business. Uh, they finished all the way to um, paving with PCC in that case or roller compacted concrete um, and then flipped traffic on top of that new wearing course uh, and performed the same thing on the opposite side. So here's an example of how that can be done in an arterial. And then uh, just as well for residential roads. Residential roads are, are tricky. These are the roads that our public assumes we're never, ever going to fix, right? They think we're just going to come through and we're going to paint it black every 25 years and, and tell them it's a new roadway. The cost of FDR uh, gives us an opportunity to fix some of these really failed roadways. Um, and when you tell, knock on the door and tell somebody you're going to fix their road and there's going to be an inconvenience, they're usually not happy. But what you can do with this process is tell them that the inconvenience is going to be very short. We can really get you guys access to your residence even during construction. And what you're getting out of this process is a long-term fix. We're not going to lie to you anymore and tell you that you're getting a new roadway. You're actually getting a bottom-up brand new roadway. Uh, and then tell them that you'll never be back on their residential roadway until probably after they're dead. Uh, because we know that these roads get very little attention. Uh, yeah. When you look at how cities and counties treat their roadways. Hey, Tyler, I just wanted to jump in there real quick. Can you flip back one more? Yeah. So when we're looking at this right here, we're looking at treating the in-place roadway in lieu of removing and replacing the entire road section. And what that means is you're probably getting the road anywhere from a foot to two feet deep using the traditional method and replacing the entire section with new rock and a new overlay cap while you're trying to manage traffic which is a nightmare and, and this option, I mean, and when you really look at it for what it is, it's a, it's much faster than the alternative and the alternative uh, timing wise is it would need to be phased or you'd have to be looking at some major road closures. I mean, when you, when you consider it and you really look at it for what it is, this is actually a very um, user friendly solution for the traveling public. Um, and, and I think the, it just helps with that communication um, aspect of it when you're talking to the, the, the residential neighborhoods or the arterials and the interrupting the businesses. It's like, hey, the alternative would be this thing would be shut down for months on end while we're gutting this whole section out. We're doing this in a matter of a couple of days or weeks. So absolutely. And I think this is a good this is a good slide to also talk about production rate. Uh, you know, if we can siphon off half of a roadway and really open it up similar to what you'd be able to accomplish with a wide open county road, you know, you can expect creeping up towards 70,000 square feet a day. Of production rate. So keep that in mind as far as a, a square footage when you're looking at how many days a section of project might take or phasing it between, you know, a major driveway access um, or maybe a, up here we deal with a lot of, you know, nut holers and different times of the season where you just can't interrupt certain parts of the economy. Um, you can get creative with how you can shift this around, but try and get the most production rate out of the actual construction process. So we'll, we'll just touch on uh, QC and quality control a little bit. I know we've already talked about it um, slightly, but what's really important when we're looking at quality control, I, I stole a picture. This is my colleague Clay's uh, computer hands holding some, some dirt here to try and make it look like he works outside still, even though he only sits in front of a computer. Um, and what's really important is these, what the way I see it is these six areas. Uh, the first one is gradation, and I put in parentheses sizing because it's not so much tweaking the gradation on site. Sure, you can add supplementary aggregate if you need to, if you're really high in fines, but really it's what's the sizing of the material that's out there? What are we dealing with in place? And then how can we come up with a mix design to best achieve our UCS strengths and hopes and dreams for that roadway based on that sizing? Um, the next important aspect is the cement spread. Um, this can be done in very primitive ways. There's, a, there's a several ways that it can be um, effectively achieved. This is an example of them putting down a tarp. The spreader goes over the top. Uh, it's a one cube, uh, square yard tarp. You simply weigh the material. That's a cross check as to uh, the work being performed out there. Moisture content is another one. Geotechnical technicians that are out there, I mean, can honestly grab a, a dirt clod and, and feel it in their hands. Uh, if we're moving in the right direction, but these are things that are tested as we go along. Mixing adequacy, just the color of the material as you get out there. Uh, density is tested using a nuclear gauge. And then thickness uh, by simply digging down, looking for the uh, treatment depth, and then testing with something like phenolphthalein 
uh, which is a it, it's just a solution that turns the material pink with the presence of cement. Um, and all of that is based on pH. So those are really the areas that are most important. And I'm going to keep jamming through this just in the sake of sake of time. So you don't hear me talking for too long. But one important um, aspect I wanted to bring up that came from our discussions with with Caltrans is what is the difference between simple material characteristics and material acceptance, FDR acceptance. And this is what we were able to hash out with them. You have the top table. This is from the previous 2018 standard spec, which says the acceptance for the RE is based on cement application, the relative compaction, and the thickness. The bottom section is simply target requirements that we're hoping to achieve. That has to do with the gradation and sizing, knowing that we're basically held to whatever is on site, trying to come up with the right mixture con uh, moisture content, UCS, um, that can be a range depending on what the materials are, but we have a target that we're hoping to achieve, wet density, and then relative compaction comes up again. The reason why those, two, those three um, items on the top are the only ones required for acceptance is because we can control them. We can fix a cement spread rate when it's happening. I encourage these REs to understand the process, and if the cement is going down too hot and heavy, call a timeout and make sure that that's corrected. The compaction is something that we can apply different efforts to in the field. Thickness is something we can catch as it's happening. So without having to scrap or fight in court with lawyers about this stuff, those are the three items that should be most important to you. Um, and with that, the 97% has, uh, has been modified through the RSS down to 95%. And then this uh, sub item A down here, which was the previous way of verifying the mixing depth for FDR was to come back and do cores after the fact. Caltrans has realized that through lessons learned, that is a poor practice. It, it prevented the road from being reopened and paved sooner to the public, and those cores simply fell apart when they did them. So now that process of verifying thickness of FDR depth is done by digging test holes during construction with the phenol phthalein to verify that. So that is some work that came out of our uh, of Caltrans revisions that I wanted to share with you guys. And then we're getting close to the end. I want to leave you guys with what some of your resources are. I've already mentioned this, myself, Dennis, my colleagues at CNCA, we're happy to help with site evaluation. Design optimi optimization is one of, our, uh, one of our favorite things to do, value engineering. We didn't talk about costing much because you guys will hate to hear this. It's the worst uh, thing for engineers to tell you, but it just depends on the projects. So if you have actual projects that you want us to take a look at, we can help with costing based on locale material costs in that region. And then you have state and national publications. The Green Book in Southern California for CSPB. This is a picture of the PCA guide to FDR with cement. Uh, this is a great comprehensive guidebook that's available for free online. I talked about the Caltrans spec, the 2018. Now you've got the RSS for FDR. Um, and then the BARM, the ARA BARM is available, um, I believe online as well. And then Caltrans also has a great FDRC guidebook that they came out with in 2013 that's readily available for use. And they're working on a new one that's going to come out to not only talk about FDR, but it's going to talk about PDR, CIR, as Dennis is about to discuss with us. Um, and cold central plant recycling. So with that, I just want to leave you guys with this. Please stop to consider FDR before you get rid of any of your in-place assets. Um, if there's any questions, we can take those now. I left a shot of my business card up here if you guys need to get a hold of me. But at this point, we're going to merge into Dennis's portion. Thank, thanks, Tyler. Appreciate it. Um, Carter Choi asked the question, says, can you recommend technical specs or Caltrans studies for FDR, i.e. design calculations, inspection standards, and curing methods and frequency? And you hit it on that last slide. Could you flip back to that one second? Absolutely. Uh, Carter, I just wanted to make a note here that the picture on the right says guide you fold up reclamation. That's one of the most comprehensive, um, easy to read FDR guidebooks I've seen. Um, and Tyler, can you tell us real quick on how to get there, or could you post that into the link after you're done sharing your screen? Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'm happy to do that. It, for those of you who are sitting at your computer, if you go into Google and just type in the, the PCA full depth reclamation guidebook, it should be the first thing that comes up in PDF form. Awesome. 
Um, yeah, and if you know, usually when we give give these presentations in person, which we I hope will happen again someday. Um, I like to bring a few of these with me and I'll, I'll always leave the hard copy. It's just a good reference guide to have at your desk yeah. uh, that walks Easy. you through the full process. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tyler. And, uh, Carter, I also wanted to mention too that the uh, Caltrans specifications and everything, they're, they're all being updated on the Caltrans website. Um, a couple of years ago when we last did our tech talk, it was, uh, I think it was 2011 since the last time that the state had updated their in-place recycling uh, web page. So uh, Tyler and I really worked hard on that over the last year and a half, two years with uh, the Caltrans headquarters people. And uh, finally, we got got some movement there. So I'm, I'm excited to share that with the group. Um, we got another question here. Uh, how how well does pulverized material work as shoulder backing? Can it meet Caltrans specifications? Do you have any thoughts on that, Tyler? Yeah, I talked earlier about using the uh, using wrap for shoulder backing if you need to strip material off first and either lose it somewhere, but you want to keep it. My my suggestion is we always keep it closest to the project, to the project site. So Caltrans, I believe, in certain districts allows for wrap to be used as shoulder backing. A lot of times the local cities and counties have different requirements as far as allowing that material. So it's up to them and to you whether or not you want to pre-pulverize and mix that wrap with the AB or subgrade below it and then figure out what to do with that material. Or if you just want to cold mill that top asphalt, distressed asphalt material, and then do something with that. A lot of times you can just strip grind that wrap off and then just convey it off to the side. So it's basically windrowed to just place right back as shoulder backing if you do have elevation concerns and whatnot. Um, but I've I've heard that question asked on some of the Caltrans committees I'm involved with, and there's different um, there's there's different requirements depending on the little nation state districts. But I do know that wrap is allowed. It's the mixing of that wrap with other materials that you're going to want to check with those individual jurisdictions. Yeah, yeah. We uh, Grand Rock actually just did this for Caltrans on, on in District Five down in Salinas. Uh, we had this ramp project and we were able to take a pulverizer in there, mix it in like Tyler just said with the subgrade and we were able to get some uh, recycled AB spec material out of it, which was exciting and we were able to reuse all that stuff. Um, so it, it can be done. Um, I Like we've been talking about this whole presentation, I think anything in the road section when it comes to aggregate, it's all gold and we need to be holding on to it. So if you guys can find use for it, that's, that's great stuff. Um, we have another question here. It says, will the presentation be posted online or sent to attendees? Uh, Keith, I hate to put you on the spot, but uh, what do you what do you think about that one right there? Well, I'm on the spot and uh, Tyler, I don't know, you are you willing to give us your slide deck? Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to yeah. say if, if it wasn't going to be provided by them, feel free to reach out to me and I've got I've got no qualms with sharing my content. So, Wensi, um, what we'll do is um, we will take this slide deck and both send it to the folks that we have email addresses for along with the survey. And then we will uh, post it on Granite Rock under Tech Talk uh, as well. So, yes, right. the answer is yes. Thanks, Keith. Appreciate it. And uh, Dennis mentioned, you know, just to answer that the last question before that one more time, uh, that PCA guide is great, but it is a national guidebook. So I always encourage um, you guys use us as the local resources to make sure that whatever your design methodology is specific to California and the cities and counties that we're working with. Um, from a from a 30,000 you know, foot perspective, that guidebook is great. But it's it's what we do every day is dig into the, to your projects that you guys have right in front of you. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And that's enough talking for me. So my good friend Dennis will take it from here. Thanks, Tyler. Appreciate it. Uh, we're a little bit past 11 o'clock right now, so we're, we're doing uh, pretty good staying on track. Um, I'd like to get you guys all out of here early. Um, so I'm going to go quickly. Uh, Tyler, I'm in the same boat you are. I can't see the uh, questions coming through. So if those come come in, please just interrupt me and we can. Uh, we can be get rolling here. So, uh, so sure. um, uh, Dennis and, and Tyler both, we, we do have another question here while you pop okay. it up. Sure. Um, any issues with FDR on coastal roads? I, I just saw that question pop up and we have not had issues with that um, whatsoever. Um, a lot of people ask, is there issues with doing it on steep grades and whatnot with the equipment? And that's not an issue either. You know, this is a really a comprehensive approach that doesn't see a lot of boundaries as far as where it can be used. 
Um, you know, in coastal areas, if we've got high winds and different weather and whatnot, it's we're going to treat it just like we are any type of project uh, by keeping tabs on high wind days as as rain days and keeping tabs on the weather that way. But aside from different authorities in those areas and water quality control and whatnot, I have not had any issues with coastal communities. Um, the more I, I've worked with CNCA and the more I've helped out with these type of projects, I, it's hard for me to find a place on the map where people are not looking into this solution at this point. So if Dennis has different insight as far as roadblocks that I might not be aware of. No, the first thing that comes to mind when we're talking about uh, coastal roads, the first thing I'm thinking about is like Mendocino or rural parts of Marin County or the central coast where it's really hard to get rock in and out and the trucking would be astronomically uh, expensive. FDR is a great solution because the other options are uh, are extreme. So yeah, I would definitely look at it. I haven't uh, ran into any issues other than the ones that you just mentioned. So I, I think our best answer for Dennis and I is that we've, we've either bid jobs or helped with jobs and seen successful construction in a lot of coastal areas. So that's, that's our best indicator at this point that it's possible. Yeah, thanks Tyler. Thanks, Keith. Appreciate it. Um, keep the interruptions coming. <laughs> I like I like questions. I'm like Tyler. I don't uh, like hearing myself speak for an hour. So uh, by all means, please, uh, please ask away. Uh, just a reminder, my name is Dennis McElroy. I'm the recycling group manager here at uh, Granite Rocks Construction Division. Uh, I've been doing this for about 10 years, and uh, this is something I'm really passionate about. Um, it's been a big part of my life for, for the last decade. Uh, so I was thinking about how what we were going to be talking about, and I've, I've met some of you before. Uh, I appreciate you joining in and giving us some time out of your day. Uh, these are some of the hot topics that I like just using as an introductory uh, subjects into this uh, this whole system of recycling. Uh, a big thing about this is there's it's really hard to dive into the details because, like I mentioned for this Caltrans general uh, presentation that Tyler and I did recently, uh, it took us a, about a year and a half to put the content together and we were just skimming the surface. You could go down in the weeds on this and there's some really technical stuff about it. And that's why relationships like Tyler and, and reaching out to people like him and his team are so important. Um, so for the agenda today, we're just going to be talking real quick about industry associations, um, aggregate resources in California. I'm going to talk real quick on what Fred mentioned and what Tyler mentioned earlier. We're going to go through in-place recycling terminology. I'm going to go into that a little bit more detail. Tyler brought it up. Then uh, we're going to talk about where PDR and FDR fall in the pavement deterioration curve and when PDR is a good option. And then equipment and binders used in the industry. It's always kind of fun showing some good pictures of jobs and, and some of our example projects. And then we'll finish it off with some cross-section details showing different examples of how this process can be used. Um, those are projects that we've done and it I like throwing those in there because it gives us a really good example on the different scenarios where we can use these types of technologies, at least when it comes to that, that top down PDR approach. I think we've done a pretty good job showing you today that that partial depth recycling or, or full depth recycling or any in place recycling is really a different animal than hot mix asphalt or um, aggregate base. And I, I think it's just a good reminder. Um, as we jump into this section of the presentation that we all have a lot of experience when it comes to uh, hot mix asphalt and aggregate base and traditional uh, pavement recycling or pavement uh, rehab techniques. But when we start looking at these other options, they have their own quality control characteristics. Tyler touched on it briefly, uh, but there's a lot of different testing we do for this uh, that wouldn't apply to HMA or AB. And so they're all in their own little buckets and we got to find the right ways to use them. Um, I also will say uh, that PDR or FDR may not be the perfect situation for every road. That's not what we're saying, but it should be the first consideration. Recycling should be the first consideration and it should be a tool in your toolbox that you're actively looking at. And then lastly, reach out to industry for assistance on project selection and design. Uh, I can't express that enough. Uh, we'll always find a, a little nugget that we can apply to the job that might help you save a change order down the road or might change your perspective on a project. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, other than Tyler and I, there's a lot of other good resources. Uh, top left corner there, there's a ARA, which is a national organization. Uh, if you go to their website, ARA.org, they have uh, some really good resources on there when it comes to 
um, specification kind of guidance and things like that. Uh, PPRA is the Pavement Preservation and Recycling Alliance, and that's a national organization as well. They have a website called roadresource.org, and it's really great stuff. You can go on there and you can see um, mixed design data, you can see project guidance, you can see a lot of different things, and they have different strategies, not only recycling, but they have some pavement preservation stuff in there too. Um, I really recommend it for um, new engineering staff that are dealing with road rehab projects. It's a good way to wrap your head around what's being used in the industry. And then if you're a, a seasoned engineer, it's just a good refresher type place to go in there and look at some, some good information. Um, the Ro uh, Recycling and Stabilizing Association of California, uh, Tyler and I with some other industry members recently started and, and our goal there is just to um, help educate the industry on what these processes are all about and uh, and promote them throughout the industry so we can um, help uh, preserve our aggregate resources throughout the state. So we're really excited about that. If you would like some more information, please reach out to Tyler and I would be happy to talk about you about that uh, any day. So um, just getting back to why we're here. Uh, potential cost saving techniques uh, that may save valuable taxpayer dollars in place recycling techniques that uh, to use material that we already paid for. And then just something to think about as we go through this binder and aggregates are non-renewable resource. And when they're gone, they're gone. And as scarcity increases, then the cost increases. And where are we going to get that additional funding from? This is how that ties into um, what Tyler was mentioning earlier and what Fred uh, Juice from the Department of Conservation mentioned um, last week. Um, I really want to focus in on this because there's some really good information here. So what, what Fred was talking about last week is that basically over the next 50 years, we're going to be running a deficit on our road quality aggregate um, up and over billions of tons of rock. And when we look at areas like right in the middle here that's highlighted and in, in, uh, that's bolded, San Fernando Valley, you're looking at less than 10 years of remaining rock in that area and what's going to happen is once that area is depleted from its permitted again permitted aggregate reserves you're going to start depleting the rock resources around that area and then you're going to have a snowball effect of those aggregates getting depleted from further and further out and once that happens and we reach kind of critical mass over the next 50 years or so we're going to have to start uh, importing rock from overseas um, or surrounding countries to cover our, our aggregate needs. And then when we're looking at our roadways, we have an aggregate source that's still good. We just need to find new creative ways to look at it and use it. And uh, we believe that PDR or FDR are good solutions to start using now um, since we already have the specifications and we already have the background and we already have contractors that know how to do this stuff instead of coming up with uh, new solutions that are going to take years and years of uh, research. So, so just getting back to how do we overcome these challenges? We learn from each other just by going to presentations like this, reaching out to people, uh, be creative and look for ways to reuse that aggregate. And then realizing we all have a shared responsibility in determining our future of our aggregates. Uh, it's, it's a really big deal and uh, we need to, we need to make it a priority to be thinking about it. So why are we recycling? Uh, proven technologies, we have more sustainable uh, solutions there if they're constructed uh, correctly. We're ex using all existing paid for materials already since they're already in the road. Requires limited new materials, Minis minimizes trucking as Tyler mentioned. We're dealing with shorter construction times and less traffic disruption. It's cost effective, removes distresses instead of covering them up and, and leading to more problems and maintenance later. Selected strategies enhance structural capacity and extends the pavement life. Recycled roads can be recycled again, and the specifications and NSSPs are already in place. Um, and then lastly, we have ex experienced contractors who are already working in California. So we put all those together and we get some, some pretty good stuff here. So uh, when we talk about terminology, I keep, I'm going to interchange and I'm going to stumble on this the whole time, but what we know previously as CIR. Uh, we're now calling PDR, and uh, because of that, uh, it's it's coming from UCPRC. So just to run through this real quick, and I hope I don't lose you, IPR is a general term for all in-place recycling. In the future, CIR will be a general term for all types of cold in-place recycling, which would include PDR, FDR, and CCPR. 
I know we have a bunch of different acronyms here. PDR <laughs> is partial depth recycling and FDR will be called full depth recycling. I know a lot of agencies have called it and even industries called it full depth reclamation. We swapped out reclamation for the term recycling and that's how we're going to be moving it forward. And then CCPR there is cold central plant. Uh, that's when we have a isolated plant where the material stays closer to the job and we recycle all of it there. Um, another interesting thing through my time at Caltrans and the PMPC program, we're going to be um, rolling out a new NSSP for the partial depth recycling where we're dealing with a merged um, group that uh, or, or specification that includes both foam and emulsions. It's kind of an interesting new development that we're going to be testing out over the next few years. So uh, we're excited to see what that looks like and put a lot of time and energy into working on that. So. Hey, Dennis, just uh, just for clarity, if somebody's looking to go grab those NSSPs from Caltrans for a CIR job, they're still calling it CIR that those those names haven't been shifted yet. Is that correct? That's correct. I think it really is. It's hinging on that guidebook that we're waiting on from the UCPRC, that guidebook that Tyler, you mentioned too, right on the back end of your presentation. And once that comes out, then I think that's when we're going to be looking pretty good right? yeah so i think all of our fears is that that we ever get lost in the translation so for all of you that know cir and are ser searching for cir just continue to to call it that i wouldn't hold your breath anybody on this call for anything mm -hmm. coming out of uc davis no offense to those guys yeah. um, but they've got a lot on their plate and it might be some time before this really takes effect so i think yeah. it's important to talk about you know the synonymous nature of some of these terms but for right now, FDR, whether it's rec reclamation or recycling, same thing, same yep. process. CIR, same thing as, yep. uh, as PDR. So don't, don't get caught up in the weeds with that. Just uh, focus more on actually utilizing these now where they can really be utilized. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. Appreciate it. Yeah, this is something that we're anticipating coming out. This is what we're looking at up at the uh, HQ level within Caltrans and, and working with UCPRC. So thanks for jumping in there, man. Uh, okay, so this is a, a different look on the recycling options when it's in relation to pavement life cycle. So on the left, we have serviceability and costs, uh, and the call that the pavement condition index. And the bottom there, we have time. So the more time goes, the more the road deteriorates. Um, at the top here, we have construction. That M and O is mill and overlay. That's when the roads in that first five to ten years, and it starts deteriorating, and you do a replacement of that top layer of the wearing course. Once you start going down that curve, you're going to look at partial depth recycling, also known as CIR in the past. Uh, that's considered maintenance. That Once you do that, you put a new overlay on, that's going back up to 100 PCI. And then in rehab, you're looking at FDR in red, bringing it all the way back up again uh, to level 100. So it just kind of shows you the different curve there. Tyler mentioned anything below 55 PCI is when you're supposed to be looking at FDR. That kind of falls in line with PDR as well. And it really de is determined based on the actual condition of the road and what kind of failure you're looking at uh, in the roadway. This is a real quick shot here. We have some examples. So on the left, we have an overlay. You're just putting a new HMA wearing course on top of an existing roadway. You're going to see this you know, uneven surface. We're not doing any fixes there and those existing cracks in the pavement will come right back up through that AC section. When you're doing a milling overlay, you're going to strip off the top of that AC layer that's existing. You're going to flatten it out create a, a smoother writing surface and then you're going to do a dig out in some areas that uh, sorry you're going to to fix certain areas of the pavement it's important to note that the area that's uh, not fixed is going to be a weaker section of road than the area that you're doing dig outs in and the areas around that are going to be subject to more fatigue cracking as they come up and over those new uh, fixed areas uh, and that's going to wear through that new wearing course when we're looking at CIR or PDR, uh, we're going to be looking at a top-down approach, and that's really the top three to six inches of the road section. And I can't express this enough. It, it needs to have a good structural sound pavement section. You're just looking at the top of the asphalt wearing out, and that's when you're looking at rehabbing the top of the pavement. FDR, as Tyler mentioned, you're fixing the whole entire road section, so you're able to grab the AC section, the AB section, and then if you need to, any underlying soils or, or subgrades and incorporate that all together so you have a new road section there. And then you put your new wearing course on top. So I just kind of want to reset CIR, PDR is top down, bottom up is FDR.
this is a mill and overlay example on the left you have some light cracking on the right you have some light rutting but it's all top down distresses in the top of the ac section this is all pretty minor uh, if you need to correct those you can just do a thin mill and overlay uh, it's not too severe and you're still on the top end of that pci curve when you start seeing areas like this top down distresses in that half a foot or one foot plus this is when you start looking at different ac like thicker structural sections and you're getting some some cracking that's not load associated that's when partial depth recycling also known as cir is going to be something you want to be considering um Here's an example of how that works. So you get top down cracking, the actual structure underneath that, the base rock and the underlying subgrades are all sound. We're gonna recycle the uh, AC section from the top down, anywhere from three to six inches, and then put your new HMA overlay on top. And if we can keep that material on the job and not export anything, you're gonna be saving tax dollars, just like with FDR. If we don't have to off all anything, that's all good. Um, you can see here in this image, and I tried to do it, it's hard to tell, but the AC section is coming up in grade. So you're raising the elevation of the roadway. That's a, a critical thing that we would like to recommend. Um, if you cannot do that due to overhead utilities like power lines or bridges or something like that, then you can mill off the top of the pavement, then recycle the AC layer and, uh, and complete the project that way. But just note that your costs are gonna be a little bit higher due to that off haul. So here we have a, an example of some equipment. This is the, the fun part that I like talking about. Um, we have a multi-unit recycler. So this has been seen in the industry for a long time. This is a your typical CIR, also known as PDR machine. Uh, on the top right, we have our, our asphalt cutting machine or asphalt milling machine that pulverizes the roadway, throws it into the conveyor belt, and it goes through this pug mill mixer and screen and crusher. You can see the, uh, the colored lines on the bottom, you have your material flow going through the machine in various belts to uh, crush and size the aggregate. This is a single unit recycler. Uh, it's a little bit different. On the top, starting at the right hand side of the screen, we have our spreading unit, then we have a water truck, then we have an oil tanker, then the recycling machine. There's usually a paver behind that, and then you have a few rollers doing final compaction. Um, this is how a single unit recycler uh, processes the roadway. So you're gonna be grinding that top three to six inches of road, and at the very top here, you can see the like, stream of oil and a stream of moisture or water being in injected into the mixture. And all that gets um, mixed together with the cement that's distributed out in front of the road. And you're basically creating your new aggregate source as you go down the roadway. You can see there's no trucking involved in any of this. It's all happening instantly, which is, uh, which is the coolest part about this whole process. This is another example of what foamed asphalt looks like so when we, whenever we say foam or expanded asphalt this is what we're doing we're actually creating foam from hot oil um, how that works is you take uh, really hot oil and you add ambient temperature or cold water to it and it's going to expand and flash and create these bubbles this is all controlled in a series of injectors that are in that drum housing um, and that basically creates what we're calling a mastic spot welding this whole aggregate structure together uh, it's been used successfully on hundreds of miles of roadway throughout California, and uh, it's been used for over 20 years throughout the uh, in, uh, internationally. Uh, here's another example of another binder that's used. This is emulsions. Uh, we have 40 to 70 percent asphalt oil mixed with some chemical solvents, polymers, and water. Um, that's injected into the mix, um, coated the aggregate. And that's what glues everything together. You're going to get a couple days of uh, curing after that while you get some evaporation. And then at the end of it, you're going to have a locked up um, new surface or road section. A lot of times when we're talking about CIR, everybody thinks about the, uh, the long trains, the first image of the uh, machine that I showed you that's a couple hundred feet long. These single unit machines are a lot, uh, a lot more compact. And uh, there's been some, some, some times when people are actually pretty surprised that we can get into areas that are um, residential or um, collector or arterial streets. This is an example of city, city of Pleasanton where we're actually managing to recycle the roadway linearly next to live traffic. Um, it's a common uh, two lane road in the middle of the city. And uh, this has been really common for us. Um, you can see the windrow coming out the back of the machine there, uh, going to the paver and doing the lay down. 
uh, and it's very contained. So uh, this this imagery is just to show you that it can be used in a lot of different applications. Hey, Dennis, we got a question that came in from Sarah, if you don't mind me interrupting sure. you for a second. Uh, she's asking, is PDRC more common than PDRFA? When would PDRFA be preferred? Uh, I think we need to clarify the difference between the PDRs or the CIRs is between FA or with E, with emulsion. Yep. Um, FA incorporates cement, a small amount of cement, a cement as a binding agent. Uh, did you want to elaborate on which one is used more frequently? Yeah, I'm kind of butchering that a little bit, aren't I? Um, sorry about that. So we have FA and we have EA. FA stands for foamed asphalt, EA stands for emulsified asphalt, and uh, both, in my opinion, can be used interchangeably. Um, the only times that you're going to be looking at using um, FA over EA is when you're trying to do night work or you're dealing with uh, high fluctuating temperatures um, or certain project characteristics that aren't going to allow you to have a more flexible curing time or that are temperature sensitive. Um, foamed asphalt just isn't as, uh, um, I don't know what the right word is. It's just, I think it's a little easier to work with and, and that's the major difference there. Um, foamed asphalt you can do at night and some of the other things, you don't have to be so hooked to, um, temperatures. So does that, does that answer the question, Tyler, you think, or do you want yeah, to Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I just gave Sarah a thumbs up for a question and yeah. I, I think versi versatile is kind of what you're looking for there as yeah. far as the difference between those two. Um, but, you know, Dennis is at the forefront of working with Caltrans and trying to get both of those specs up to up to speed, which is essentially going to be a merging of those two, which leaves it up to the designer to to just pick and choose which one is better for that particular project. And I think yeah. Dennis just talked on a lot of the factors that could come into play when mm -hmm. they're making that determination. So both yeah. adequate choices. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question, and I apologize for the confusion on that. I'm just going to stick with PDR through the rest of this instead of flip flopping back and forth. Um, the other thing is, is uh, or I, I can't express enough, and this is a really good example on why it's so important to reach out to the industry experts. And if it's not me, hopefully it's you, Tyler, or, or somebody else who's experienced in this stuff. There's a you can go down the rabbit hole really quickly on the on the science of it or the certain specific requirements, and that's that's what we're all here for, and that's why we like sharing all this information. Um, so I, I hope you guys feel comfortable reaching out to us in the future. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if Anthony's on the call, but he's been leading our internal charge on, uh, on trying to merge those specifications. Uh, industry has uh, felt that in the past we might've made things a little too confusing. And so our hope is that Caltrans utilizes the new specification that we wrote and makes it easier for the owner to, to choose partial depth recycling as it stands and then the best binder is going to be used in this situation because they're they're equals in my opinion so we're working on that now trying to make things easier so thanks thanks tyler okay and um can i jump in just for a minute uh for a point of clarification uh for sarah's question pdr fa versus pdr ea uh is probably a more uh, of what your question should be, you're going to use cement in either one of those, correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, hopefully that that's crystal clear, Sarah. If not, go ahead and, and chime in. And then, um, Tyler, do you want to pick up Ed's comment here and, and just uh, relate that to the group? Yeah, no problem. And I wasn't going to be the guy who talked about cement, so thanks for doing that for me, <laughs> Keith. Um, yeah, so Ed just chimed in too, and his comment is, for those of you who don't see the chat, is PDR-EA with emulsified asphalt can only be used on the asphalt layer. PDR-FA, foamed asphalt, can be used if there's a chance of aggregate base being included into that recycled layer. Um, so Ed's got your back here too, Dennis. We'll let you carry on. Yeah, thanks, thanks Ed, for jumping in on that. I appreciate it. That's a, that's a good point. We all know that these roads that we're all working on that are below PCI 55, they're all been maintained over the last 20, 30 years and they're pretty variable. Um, FDR and PDR are both pretty flexible when you're, when you're looking at it from a constructability standpoint. So if there is variations in the pavement structure, they're forgiving. Um, when it comes to foam, like Ed said, if you get into the AB a little bit, it, it's not going to be detrimental to the mix and you're not going to be looking at total road failure. So it's a, it's a good thing. So thanks, Ed, for bringing that up. Thanks, Tyler. Thanks, Keith. Appreciate it. 
So just uh, I just got done showing everybody a video. This is what a finished PDR surface example looks like. This was done in 2019. City of San Jose looks like a brand new road. Um, this is before the wearing course has been applied. You can see traffic's running on it. There's no cone set up. The road had already been recycled, laid down with the paving machine, fog sealed, sanded, temp striped. And we're in that three to seven day cure period for this while we're getting some final testing results rolling in before the overlay goes down. But this is what the traveling public would be running on during that period after construction had been completed on the on the in-place recycled layer. Uh, here's a real quick example, and I, I think I need to speed up here a little bit. Uh, it's already 1130. Uh, the project size of this job, this is just a, a good example, um, 638,000 square feet. Uh, it's two lanes each direction. It's, it was originally designed as a conventional remove and replace job. It was a three inch mill, six inch dig outs, and that uh, RHMA overlay and a leveling course was spec on the back end of that after you did the repairs. And that bid total was 2.5 million and some change. Uh, we did a CIR or PDR alternative with a two inch wedge cut, also known as a key cut, where you just cut the exterior portion of the roadway doing a four inch PDR with foamed asphalt and a two inch RGMA overlay. Uh, there was a net savings of about 16% or 418,000 back in 2012. And all the contractors since that point have gotten more efficient and uh, productivity has gone up. We were going pretty slow back then on these first couple jobs we were doing. And it's important to note that this was on Monterey Highway. This is a major thoroughfare from Blossom Hill uh, tying in closer to Highway 85 right in, in the city of San Jose. Um, it's getting a lot of traffic. This is the old 101 back in the day. Uh, here's an example of that, like I mentioned, two lanes each direction. Uh, it had every kind of pavement condition that you could have uh, seen. Uh, it had years of alligator crack surface, years of patching, raveling potholes, oxidized pavements. It even has sections with slurry seals on it where they were trying to maintain that, that layer from getting uh, oxidized and, and wearing out faster. Um, when we recycled the road away, we were able to uh, save 780 truckloads of being exported and imported off the job, which is 15,600 tons of aggregate to and from the landfills and quarries. That's a huge amount of material. And um, we were able to do it faster about half the time. We, we completed the PDR layer in nine days and it, the original um, removed and replaced it doing dig outs throughout the whole job would have taken 18. So we were able to do it half the time. That's less exposure for the traveling public. It makes things more efficient for everybody. And that job's still performing great. Um, we mentioned it earlier, but the uh, savings is coming from the conservation of energy, the emissions reduction, the aggregate reduction, dumping material. If you're in the Bay Area or places that are uh, heavily populated. A lot of times those dump sites are, are a lot more expensive and um, we're dealing with faster production times. So that combined savings translates anywhere from 15 to 20 percent, maybe even higher. Um, a lot of times we also hear too, or get the questions on, well, how, how well does this material hold up during curing? And we've all heard of horror stories where, you know, a road didn't work out. Well, 99% of the time the road works out and uh, we just need to take the proper precautions to design the road for what it, it really needs to be performing as. And like I said, every road uh, may not use PDR, FDR as a solution, but when it's engineered correctly, it's going to perform. Uh, this is a good example. There was good structure underneath this. Uh, the recycled layer was compacted thoroughly. Uh, the quality control effort was sound. Everything was going smoothly. Um, this is what a road should be looking like after it's done. On, on the left, you see skid marks where somebody was doing heavy braking or maybe that was a burnout and somebody got a new toy. On the right, you can see three quarter inch dig outs, RHMA overlay, and then the foam layer in between. Um, it's holding up great. You, I can't even tell the difference between all three. So this is what an ideal uh, in-place recycling job should be looking like after completion. Um, years later, it's still holding up very well and uh, it's still continuing to perform. We actually worked with UCPRC to recently schedule some uh, site investigation and some coring of the, uh, the layer just to do some research about 10 years after completion and uh, things are looking pretty good. Some of the cores are, are pretty substantial and they're, they're currently evaluating that. So um, here's another quick example just on what this looks like going through a, a residential area. 
uh, on a collector street. A big thing I wanted to make a note of is there's uh, uh, some traffic flowing towards the downward part of the screen on the right hand side of that road. Uh, that was all completed that morning. Uh, it was a very linear operation. The, the, when you were recycling in place, we're managing traffic and we're working around everything and it allows traffic flow uh, very nicely. So, and it's got that, that kind of grayish tint to it because it's got a little bit of sand on top of it. Um, a lot of times we're able to recycle anywhere from 75 to 120,000 square feet in a single shift, uh, which is a substantial amount of surface area covered. And a lot of times it's higher than, uh, than what uh, you typically see on typical paving operations. So it's just a good visual um, going through intersections and, and handling traffic and mixing. We're going to start kind of going through some examples here of some cross section details. I just like throwing these in here because it kind of gives a different idea of what um, some of the different scenarios we've been in before. Um, it's important to note that the in-place recycling machines that we all use, whether it's a multi-unit or single unit machine, they're all 12 and a half feet wide at the mixing head. They're closer to 14 feet wide once you add all their other iron and, and conveyor belts and everything on the sides of them. So they need a, a decent width to, to move down the roadway. You can see the recyclable area here is 12 feet each direction off of center line. And the in-place recycle layer is just from fog line to fog line. The shoulders are not being treated. A lot of agencies choose to do this because it allows more dollars to be spent where it really matters, where the heavy loading is actually occurring. The new overlay goes all the way from ETW, I'm sorry, EP to EP, edge of pavement, edge of pavement. So it's just a good example of what that looks like here. So Marin County, 2015, they've done this um, annually for a few years now. Um, this is after the CIR layer has been completed, but before the overlay has been installed. So again, this is a exposed CIR surface to traffic. Uh, you can see de temporary delineation on the exterior portion of the road, and it's kind of hard to see, but there's some yellow lines going down the middle of it. This is uh, what the traveling public would be exposed to during that cure period again. City of San Jose, staying off of the, uh, the gutter pan, uh, they're able to uh, key cut or wedge cut the exterior and then apply that cost that they'd be spending to uh, target more surface area for the in-place recycling. This is a typical cross-section detail, PDR, uh, two-lane road, edge of pavement to edge of pavement. They're looking for a 2.5% cross slope, uh, 12 feet to 15 foot variable lane. So they're able to go a little bit wider than, than 12 feet. They don't always have to be 12. We can use a supplemental milling machine to extend the width a little bit, uh, depending on the situation. So that's not a problem. And this is a good example of what that looks like. This was done in Yolo County a couple years ago. On the right, we have the existing old pavement. On the left, we have the newly treated um, partial depth recycled layer uh, going to the edge of, uh, edge of, uh, edge of pavement. This is a this is a really fun project. I was like talking about Marin County again. Uh, they reached out to us in advance of the project being really in design. They were like, "Hey, we want to do this residential neighborhood and want to do these cul-de-sacs, but we don't really know how to do it." Uh, and so we were able to toss around some ideas, and it, we came up with some really interesting solutions. And the job went really smoothly. Uh, you can see here that the main travel way of that cul-de-sac is being replaced with. Uh, uh, and mixed with CIR or partial depth recycling. And then on the exterior of the cul-de-sac, um, we're actually doing something different there. We're, we're doing a uh, remove and replace. And that's probably one of the only times you're gonna hear me say that, but uh, this is a, an example of why we wanna do that. The, the machine itself, if you've seen it in person or you've seen asphalt milling machines, when you have a, a 12 and a half foot uh, recycler, it, it's a big machine and it's hard to turn sometimes. And we don't want to get stuck in a cul-de-sac for three, four, five hours trying to mix those corners. So we said, okay, we'll, we'll sacrifice the corners, um, re remove and replace them because it's more efficient. So we dug those out and paved them back and we left a straight shot uh, coming directly out of the back of the cul-de-sac to be mixed. You can kind of see a different angle here. Uh, we left the gutter pan low so that way we don't have to come back and re-grind re that area along the outside edge of pavement. And we're able to process the whole entire uh, mainline area uh, very easily. So that's a, a good example there. <clears throat> Point Reyes Pendulum Road. Uh, this is a shoulder widening. This is an interesting one. So on the left, obviously, we have the old uh, previously uh, worn out pavement. It was pretty narrow. There was a lot of bicycles. 
And on the right, we have uh, the repaired road that's been widened, uh, shoulder packed uh, and looking, looking beautiful. Uh, how we did that was we excavated the outer shoulder areas to the, the width we wanted. Uh, we had uh, Marin County actually had stockpiled a bunch of um, previously um, deposited wrap or grindings from previous jobs. They had big giant stockpiles because they had the space for it. And it was close to the job and they decided, okay, once we excavate these outside areas, three feet to four feet wide, we're going to bring all those grindings in, compact the 95%, use it as our new um, imported road structure. So we're using 100% wrap on the job. And then we um, cold recycled all the way to the new edge of pavement. And now we have a new road. Uh, it was really efficient and uh, worked out beautifully. And the road's holding up uh, fantastic. So it was, it was a really cool project to be a part of. So I've showed um, a cul-de-sac in a residential neighborhood. We have some collector streets. We have some two-lane rural roads, a lot of different scenarios that we've done. And uh, then we come to uh, major highways and we've done some pretty heavily trafficked roads like expressways and things like that. So this material performs very well. And uh, we're very excited to be working with Caltrans on this upcoming project. It's gonna be uh, right around April, May when we get into construction on this, if the weather holds. Uh, it's Highway 1 from the north end of Santa Cruz County going up 10 miles, 10.6 miles into San Mateo County along the coast. Uh, three inch deep parcel depth with foamed asphalt and it's about 182,000 square yards. So now this is the other end of the spectrum where we have, uh, you know, a lot of different variables. It's a highly trafficked area. It's high speeds on a highway and uh, we're, we're very excited to be working on it. So here's just some quick information. On that, the Caltrans decided to go with uh, edge of travel way to edge of travel way. We're not going to be recycling the shoulders. So we're going to get more bang for our buck linear down the road, and um, and we're going to be mixing three inches. Uh, on the bottom right here, I highlighted this area with a red box. Once we did our site investigation on the job after it was awarded uh, for mixed designs, we found that the data that was shown in the plans and specs was very close to what we found in the field. And that was very reassuring for us as a contractor. It kind of ties back into what Tyler mentioned uh, earlier in his presentation. Uh, if the owner does a very good job doing a site investigation, construction goes smoother. So when we're getting ready for, for production now, as we get closer, we're all very confident that we're not gonna be really exposed to any different material types or uh, variables that, that weren't known about. And it's just going to make everything go go that much smoother. So the more you can include on the plans and spec side, the better. Uh, and then this is just a, a quick example of what we kind of expect the uh, final construction to be looking like. You got the new overlay getting installed on top of the uh, the finished PDR surface with the milled shoulder on the right, uh, conforming. So we're kind of all all the different types of operations going on there at the same time. Just to recap real quick, we have uh, we've covered a lot today. I appreciate your guys' patience. We covered pavement rehab techniques from partial depth recycling to full depth recycling. Uh, we talked about resources from CNCA, which is their, their FDR guidebook that I, I can't say enough good things about. Uh, we talked about value engineering support and how helpful Tyler and his team can be. We're also a resource, uh, the Recycling and Stabilizing Association of California. I'm happy to talk to anybody about that at any time, so please reach out. Uh, I mentioned roadresource.org. That's a, a great website to visit if you're just looking to poke around and learn more about these techniques and, and other payment preservation stuff. And then we talked about the, the different scenarios. We talked about sustainability, um, aggregates, and uh, reducing project costs and all those good things. Uh, Tyler, do you want to add anything on the, on the back end here as we get closing? I don't have anything, don't have to, anything add, to add, but I would... I'd like to uh, give Granite Rock a little bit of a plug, and this isn't because I like you, Dennis, but Granite Rock has really established themselves as kind of a unicorn in the contractor space because what you have in them is a contractor that does HMA paving, but they've also adopted these through Dennis's division, adapted these uh, recycling techniques as well. So what's so impressive about what these guys are doing is you can be assured that when they're bidding a project, uh, regardless of how it's put out to bid, they're going to be looking at it to give you the most value, uh, to add the value to that project. Yep. Uh, and being that they have all of these resources in-house to actually build the projects in a whole slew of different ways, 
um, I think you can you're going to find that that this is a, this is quite quite the endeavor that the, these guys have taken on. The investment that you guys have put towards this equipment and the investment that you guys have put towards the time to learn about the engineering, it's a kind of a perfect marriage between the suites of solutions that you guys are capable of doing and the engineering that backs them up. So I just wanted to leave these folks with that thought. Um, other than that, I don't have anything else to add. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for that. It's a, it's a, it's been a, a great ride so far. We're happy to be here. So. Just leave that one. Uh, that thanks one. for the kind words, uh, uh, Tyler. That uh, makes me feel good, actually, and uh, we sure appreciate that. Um, how about some final questions from the field for these guys? Uh, outstanding job today, gentlemen. Um, even even somebody like me learn some some stuff so uh we've got a question here from anthony for existing roads that contain fabric or paving mat could they be used for fdr or pdr paving for existing roads that contain fabric or paving material mats uh, could they be used for fdr or pdr uh, we've ran into that pretty frequently actually when it comes to pdr um it's been used really, it's a funny story. My my dad actually spent a big part of the 80s laying down paving fabrics all over the state of California. And him and I argue about it all the time. I keep telling him to stop doing it or why the hell did you do that? Because <laughs> you're creating a back end problem later. But um, paving fabrics are very expensive to be recycling at facilities. And Stuart Maggard, uh, our, oper uh, our manager for our operations up at uh, Redwood City Hot Plant and our recycling facility did a really good job kind of expressing some of the concerns with uh, paving fabrics that does increase cost when you export that. Uh, we haven't seen any um, decrease in strengths or road performance when we mix that in. Actually, Monterey Road, that example I showed, actually had paving fabrics in it and we were able to pulverize the roadway. It gets um, the fabric tears because it's older and it just gets mixed back into the roadway. Um, the offsetting costs in an area like this are gonna be uh, astronomical to recycle. And uh, so we just incorporate that material into the into the mix. Tyler, do you wanna add anything on the FDR side? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, uh, we get that question a lot on the FDR front and the, the short and easy answer is that it creates no issues. Um, what I like to do is when I get that question is, is try and broaden why we're even asking that question in the first place. Uh, because Dennis isn't wrong. I mean, his dad, as well as a lot of others, spent a lot of years uh, advocating for this, using materials like fabrics. And here we are now with an FDR needed on a road that has fabric. So we're, we're needing to fully reconstruct a road that was once promised to last forever because of the fabric that's placed in these. So the folks that I've talked to across the, the suite of contractors that does this type of work says, for the pulverizing machine, that fabric is like protein powder. They munch it up, they mix it in with the base. It makes up such a minor portion of that matrix when they're treating, especially down to 12, 15, 18 inches, that bring it on. You know, it's pretty brittle at this stage in its lifespan. So it gets munched up. Uh, I've heard very few instances where that mat has been wrapped around a drum in the case of FDR. Uh, usually it's just incorporated right into that pulverized base. So hopefully that answers the question. Uh, good question, Anthony, and an outstanding answer, you guys. Thank you. Any other questions out there for these gents? <clears throat> okay, again, just appreciate it. Um, you guys are uh, just really leading the day. That's outstanding, and I and can't thank you enough. Uh, Dennis, you're going to provide us your slide deck as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So um, I will send out uh, an email that will have both slide decks and the survey. Um, and we will get that out to you here shortly. We sure appreciate everyone who took the time to join us. And uh, we really appreciate those insightful questions. That that kind of brought to life uh, some of what you all are facing out there or are uh, questioning out there. That concludes today's Tech Talk. Please join us again next Thursday on March 18th, and the discussion will include uh, granite green, green concrete, and concrete materials and design. Be safe and rock on. Thanks, everybody.